Hi, I'm Brian Hayes, a Salesforce and Pardot consultant with Rotive. We're an official Salesforce partner and we help small businesses automate their processes. This video is taken from our one week Pardot course. We're giving you all of our lessons on segmentation for free. The first part of the video is covering all of our lessons around strategy and the core principles you need to understand for segmentation in Pardot. The second part of our video today are all of our build lessons. So these are videos that are step-by-step -step showing you how to build out different assets within Pardot. We hope you find it useful. And if you do, you can see all of our other lessons from the one week Pardot course by going to academy.rotive.io or by clicking the link in the description below. Hello, and welcome to day three. Today, we're talking about segmentation. We'll be talking about why you should segment your database at all, and then the tools that are available to you within Pardot. We've actually got quite a few to choose from. We'll dig into list building and talk about the different types of lists, like static and dynamic. And then we'll go through scoring and grading and how you can use both of those metrics to help you understand who the best leads are and who you should be reaching out to first. And then in the build section of the day, we're actually gonna build out a dynamic list of prospects. We'll build out a static list to be used for internal testing. We'll build out another dynamic list, but this one for competitors that you can use for suppression. And then finally, we're gonna set up and configure grading and scoring. So it should be a good day all about segmentation and how you can better break down your database to better improve your marketing and communication. So let's get started. So first of all, the reason why you wanna segment your database is so that you can better market to your prospects or to your customers. If you don't segment your database, then you're treating everybody in your system exactly the same. So instead, you should break them apart into lists or into different groups so that you can send something that's more relevant to them. You can send them a message that they're more likely to care about, or you can put an offer in front of them that's gonna be a little more resonant. Within Pardot, we can segment in a few different ways. First off is creating different lists. So that would be just creating different groups of people based off any sort of criteria you might think is relevant. So some of them might include you know, prospects versus customers or locations, say Californians versus Arizonans. Or maybe we're looking at specific industries. Somebody in construction is gonna use different terminology and care about things that are quite different from somebody who is say in software as a service. Well, within Pardot, we can use lists, whether static or dynamic, to add prospects into different groups and then send them different messaging based off that. Another tool that's available is scoring and grading. So with a grade, understanding how good of a fit they are for us, and with a score, how interested are they in us, you can then start to prioritize these prospects and perhaps send them different information based on that or get a salesperson involved at a different point in time. If we have a very highly qualified person who's showing some interest in our business, well, that's usually worth a salesperson's time. And you're gonna to wanna to get a personal salesperson involved as soon as possible with a highly qualified prospect. Similarly, if we have somebody who's showing a lot of interest but they're not highly qualified, well, then we probably just wanna send them more nurturing. We don't wanna have a salesperson spend a lot of their precious time chasing them down. Let's use automation tools built into Salesforce and Pardot to help with that. So at the end of the day, the reason why we wanna segment is to better serve and communicate with people in our database whether they're prospects, partners, customers, if we understand them better and we can break them into smaller groups, we can send them a more relevant and effective message. Let's talk about the most important segmentation tool in Pardot, lists, and how to use them. So segmentation lists are actually pretty flexible in the system. You can, of course, use them to create a list of people that you'd like to send an email to or to send a series of emails to with an engagement program, but you can also use them for suppression. So any list that you create, any list of people, can act as a filter against your outgoing campaign, your outgoing messaging. So for example, you might wanna use a list of competitors as a suppression, so you're not accidentally sending you know, important IP or marketing material to your competition. You could also use suppression for VIP customers. Uh, maybe you've got a robust automation program going on, but you've got a few customers that have been with you for a really long time, uh, and they have your cell phone number. So perhaps you don't wanna automate any messaging to them, so you could add them to a VIP list and use that for suppression. 
Another use case is for internal testing. You can add your own colleagues to a list within Salesforce uh, as an internal test list, and then make sure that all of the emails that you're building look great before you finally hit that send button to your customers. Another way to think about leveraging lists is to combine them. So once we get into dynamic lists, you'll see that we can create rules to pull people on or off of these different lists. But the other thing is you can actually reference each other. So if somebody is on the executive list because they're a CEO and they're also on the California list because they're in Los Angeles, we could combine those two. We could create an executives in California list that just references those two or even references a suppression list to keep people off it. So once you start building these and building out these, these little blocks essentially, you can combine them in all sorts of different ways. And at the end of the day, we wanna save time so that you can get a core group of people that you're trying to communicate with and send a relevant message. We want you to be able to do that as fast as possible. And so having this flexibility with list building is just another tool to help you accomplish that. In Pardot, there are two different types of lists. There's static lists and dynamic lists. Static lists are ones that you can manually add and remove people from. They don't change unless you change them by adding or removing people. Dynamic lists are a little bit different. You can't manually add or remove somebody from that list. Instead, it's based on rules and you define what those rules are and then it updates automatically. That's why it's dynamic. So by far, I prefer to use dynamic lists. As much as possible, you wanna use lists that you can reuse. Build them once and then leverage them in all sorts of campaigns in the future dynamic are best suited to accomplish that because you set those rules up once and then they continually update. So to give you an example of a dynamic list might be leads added this week. We could take a look at the created date of lead records and add them to a list automatically or perhaps existing customers or existing customers in California or maybe executives, anybody who has a CEO like president, chief executive, chief operating officer, these would make for great dynamic lists and could be used multiple times in all sorts of campaigns well into the future. Static lists also have their place, you know, not my favorite, but they are quite handy for things that aren't going to change over time. So let's say you just came back from a VIP event or a trade show, something like that. And in your hands, you have the list of attendees. Well, it's in the past, right? People aren't gonna travel back in time to go to that trade show, and therefore we don't need a list that's gonna update. A static list is perfect. We can upload that CSV of people, put them on a static list called the 2022 trade show attendees, uh, and then we do all sorts of things with it. You know, follow up, run our campaigns off that. So the, typically, if, if you've got something where the parameters are not going to change who's on it, like attendance to an event in the past, uh, static list works perfectly well for that. And it's quite easy to manage that. But most of the time, I'm going to encourage you to create more dynamic lists. So hopefully, in the end, you're creating fewer and you're spending more time working on your messaging and working directly with customers instead of building out lists in Pardot. Scoring and grading. So in Pardot, we've got two metrics, a score and a grade, to understand how important or how high quality a lead is in your system, or of course a prospect. A lot of other systems will just have one score. It'll be the lead score. And the higher the score, the better the lead is, supposedly. But that's really not telling you the whole story. And so the scoring and grading component within Pardot gives you more information, which gives you more flexibility in how you want to deal with that particular prospect and how you should reach out to them. So we have these two metrics, a score and a grade. Let's look at Pardot here. I've pulled up a prospect record. If you look under insight, we've got a score of 50 and a grade of B. So the score is a number, the grade is a letter. And the score, shorthand, it's an indication of how interested they are in you. How much are they interacting with your marketing materials, with your website, with your emails? The grade is more of an indication of how interested you are in them. 
How good of a fit are they for your business? Do they meet your standard ideal profile? Maybe that's a job title or a location. Maybe it's the size of the organization. It's those sorts of data points about that person will contribute to their grade. And so when you have both of these things together, you get the full story. How interested are they in us? And how interested are we in them? If we only had one, you could run into an issue where you're getting a lot of noise instead of signal. For example, if you've got somebody who wants to work for you, maybe they're a college student and they're trying to get an internship. Well, they should be all over your website, learning about you as they try to apply and prepare for interviews. Well, the more they interact with your website and your emails and your marketing, the more white papers they download, their scores is going to go higher and higher and higher. But if they're an intern, if they're not a potential buyer, they're a potential employee, they are not going to be a good fit. So if you pass them over to sales as a lead with a really high score saying, look at this, we've got this hot, this great, this good lead for you, they're not going to be too happy with you. Because once they pick up the phone and talk to them, they'll realize there's no potential business here. Similarly, let's say you've got somebody who has a grade of an A+. They are your perfect customer. Well, if they have an A+, and let's say they only interact with a couple of your marketing materials. Let's say they sign up for your newsletter. Maybe there's not a whole lot of points you're going to give for somebody just wanting to get a newsletter or maybe watch a video. But if they're an A-plus prospect, that's probably still worth a salesperson's time to give them a call, to reach out, to be proactive, try and get them on the phone because they are the perfect target for your services. So when you have both, you can differentiate between those situations. And of course, then there's everybody in the middle. People who have really high scores and are increasingly high grades and, and vice versa. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. The other thing I like about grade in particular is that it'll let you see the quality of your lead generation efforts high in the funnel. So long before you're looking at pipeline or closed revenue, you can see generally how qualified, how good are the leads that we're getting from whatever the marketing effort is. Because as soon as you add them to Pardot, they're gonna start getting graded based off the criteria we set up. So if you are running an ad and you're seeing that a lot of the prospects coming from that ad that you're running are getting graded as C's and D's and F's, you don't have to wait three weeks to see if anything comes from it. It's probably not the right targeting on the ad and you should proactively try and tweak that. So it's a good early indicator of marketing performance even before we start talking about pipeline and revenue. And again, these two together is really where they're powerful. So you can understand who are the best leads based off their interest in you and your interest in them. Welcome back. We're gonna go through building out a dynamic list in Pardot. So the reason why I like dynamic lists so much is because they stay updated for you. So there's less of a need to create new lists in the future. If you build out dynamic lists in such a way that they are reusable in general, it'll save you a ton of time in your future campaigns. So let's first go to the area where we can create a new dynamic list. Click on the Prospects tab in Pardot, and then on the left-hand side, you'll see a menu that says Segmentation. If you click on that, Segmentation Lists is the first option. And here we've got a table with all of our lists in it. If you wanna see more than five lists, on the right-hand side, at the bottom, you can increase this to show you 25 or 50 lists at a time. Now, you can actually get to this screen from all over the system. Even in automations and in Pardot email, there's menu items that bring you right back here to segmentation lists. And that's because these lists are the basis for any email you wanna send, whether it's a one-time list email or if it's a engagement program with a series of messages over a period of time. Looking at our table of lists, there's a column here that says dynamic and it either says no or yes. So of course we want as many uh, dynamic lists as we need. Go ahead and click the add list button in the upper right hand corner. And now we can give this a name. So at this point I'll say, there's a few dynamic lists that I'd recommend you build out. Typically you want a list of your prospects or leads, the people who are not yet customers. And then of course a list of your current customers. If you've got some sort of a service or a subscription type business, it's also helpful to have a dynamic list of people who have churned, who are former customers as well. From there, we can get more specific. You know, maybe you have multiple product lines, and so we might want to break it up into people who are customers of one product line, but not of the other. 
because that could be a great you know upsell segment for you. So to start off with, go with customers, people who are not yet customers, and former customers. Those are our three main groups to, to begin with, at least. So in my case, I'm going to build out a dynamic list of customers. I'm going to call it customers, and then we can put it in a folder. So as we build out different assets in Pardot, you can create a folder structure to help stay organized. So I'm going to hit choose, and I'll create a new folder called the one week Pardot course. Nice place for me to save all the assets we create for this course. But you may want to create a folder structure that's either based around campaigns and marketing initiative or more general, like here's all of our customer lists or competitor lists, that kind of thing. You can add a tag to an extra level of organization here. And then the most important thing is this checkbox that says dynamic list. When you check that, the blue button in the lower right hand corner changes to set rules. If you uncheck it, it just says create list. So once it's dynamic, we've got that one extra step, which is to set the rules that membership is based on. I'm going to click on set rules. Oh, looks like I've already got a list called customers. Let me call this current customers and hit set rules. Okay, now as we build out this list, we can either add rules or rule groups. We're gonna start with rules and then we'll come back to rule groups in a minute. So click add new rule and you get a drop down with all the different types of rules you can create for this segmentation. Now at the end of the day, it's all about either data, what we know about that prospect or about their activity. What have they done? What forms have they filled out? That sort of thing. So we've got prospect default field here this is gonna have any fields on the prospect record like name, email address, phone number, that sort of thing. And then prospect account field. So since I'm looking for customers, all of my customers are gonna be accounts and contacts. So I'm gonna choose prospect account field. And then here's all my list of fields that have been mapped for the account object into Pardot. If you're missing something that you expect to be there, it probably hasn't been mapped into Pardot yet. So you can refer to an earlier video we have in the administration day to see exactly how you could map that custom field. But for a customer, we're gonna choose the type field. And in Salesforce, we have a type field with the options, customer direct, customer channel, prospect, etc. So in my case, I would go with customer direct. But you saw we have another value there for customer channel. So I'm gonna add another rule and I'm really gonna duplicate it again, essentially, so that we get accounts that are either channel customers or direct customers, we want both. So I'm gonna come back down here and find, oh, I'm in the wrong area. Let me go back to prospect account field, and go down to type is customer channel. So now we've got these two rules. And the thing to pay attention here is the small little and in between them. So we're not gonna match anybody with this rule because we're looking for people that are labeled as customer direct and customer channel. This is pulling from a pick list, so it's mutually exclusive. So we're not gonna have any luck with that. But if we change this radio button up here from match all to match any, that little and changes to an or. So now we're looking for people who are customer direct or customer channel. So we'll get prospects that are related to either type. And we could add additional rules here. We could go further and say we only want customers in California or Arizona, or perhaps have purchased a particular type of product. So this is a pretty good start here. Now let's take a look at rule groups. If you add a rule group, what that allows you to do is it adds the exact same types of rules. Our options are all the same in terms of the fields that are dropped down here, but you can change the logic in between the rules within the group. So essentially a group is like a set of parentheses in a math equation. So our logic, our, whether it's and or or, is only going to be placed within this group. And then on the outside of it, we've got or here. So let me see here. Let's take a look at a couple other rules, maybe a couple that are a bit more advanced. So there's, there's one in here called prospect opportunity status. Looks pretty good. And I don't think we need this last rule. 
at this point, since we only have one rule within the group, we actually don't really need the group at all. I'll delete it in just a second. But I wanted to point out that you could get to this idea of prospects being customers through opportunities as well. So Pardot can see opportunities if a contact is listed under opportunity contact roles on that record. So it's not always the most reliable. Generally, I would say use that type field, make sure that that is updated and accurate in your system, but you can also use the relationship to an opportunity and whether or not that opportunity is one to try and understand if someone's a customer. All right, I'm gonna delete that for right now. So the other thing we could do is instead of having two rules here to represent customer direct and customer channel, we actually combine them into one because they both have the word customer in them. So I could change this to contains and write customer. And then that would match to both of those rules, right? Both of those values and simplify our dynamic list here. As long as we don't have a value here that says former customer, that would be a good strategy. So let me change that back to contains customer. Perfect, simple. And then hit run rules. Whenever you create a new dynamic list, it's always gonna show zero at first. This is because it takes a few minutes in the database to run through all of your records and find out who matches and who doesn't match. It might take five or 10 minutes, but when it's done, it's gonna send you an email to say that that dynamic list has been updated and you can come back and check it. And you can actually see if, if anybody matched and if so, how many. So those are the steps to take to create a dynamic list in Pardot. In a few minutes, we can come back here and see if it's been updated. But a general guidance here is try and keep your dynamic list as simple as they can be. You've got a lot of opportunity for complexity. You can add many, many rules and you can have rule groups to control that logic between the rules. But if it's possible to narrow it down just to one rule, that would be ideal. So you've got the opportunity for complexity, but keep it simple when you can. It'll be a little bit easier to maintain. And for your first few dynamic lists, we recommend you create one for prospects, as in people who are not yet customers, for customers, and for former customers. In this video, we're gonna build a dynamic list with competitors on it. And we're gonna talk about the use of suppression lists within Pardot. So any list in Pardot can be used for suppression, which means it can act as a filter and prevent emails from going to anybody on that suppression list. And it's not a special designation of a list. It's something that you configure when you're gonna send out that email or when you build that engagement program, there's a little area and you can include any lists that you wanna have used for suppression. And so again, any list can be a suppression list, but we've got recommendations on some ideas for suppression lists. And it's a valuable tool. It just helps you be more targeted in the messaging that you're sending out. And it ultimately helps you work with fewer lists. It helps save you time because you don't have to create all these additional versions of lists that are just removing particular people. You can remove them in a dynamic way with a dynamic list. So a couple of examples of suppression lists. One is gonna be VIP customers, people who are used to calling you on your cell phone. Maybe you don't want them to get any sort of automation. Well, then you can suppress them. Any prospects that are currently involved with a salesperson where there's an open opportunity, maybe an open opportunity above a certain uh, value is one that you might wanna suppress. You certainly don't wanna make the mistake of emailing a prospect with a discount code or a big coupon or something in the middle of a negotiation with that salesperson and that prospect. The salesperson would not be too happy about that. You can also create suppression lists that are controlled by salespeople, make them CRM visible, and maybe it's people that the salesperson does not want you to reach out to because maybe they're not a great customer. Maybe they've got a different specific outreach strategy that they wanna take on and they wanna take control of that communication. All those are great examples of lists that can be used for suppression. The one that we're gonna to build today is a dynamic list of your competitors. There's a great trick for automatically adding competitors to that list as you go. Now, of course, you could create a static list and you could you know, create prospect records for your competitors and add them you know, one at a time, but let's automate this a bit. So step one is create the dynamic list. 
click the add list button here under the segmentation list area and let's give it a name, competitors. If I do have a list that I know I'm gonna use for suppression, I like to put in parentheses suppression as well. Just makes it a little bit easier to find. It's another thing that's useful for tagging a list. That way you can quickly find all of your suppression lists in the table. And of course, we could always put it in a folder if you'd like to. So check the box for dynamic and hit set rules. So the rule we're gonna use is prospect default field. Here it is in the list. And we're gonna look at the email address. Now you could also look at the company field and say, you know, anybody whose company is competitor A, competitor B, competitor C, let's add them to this list for suppression. I prefer to use email because oftentimes you've got a newsletter or something and you might not be asking for the company field. Or somebody puts in a different company name or they spell their company in multiple ways. But with an email address, it's much more consistent. So we'll select prospect default field, then click the second drop down and choose email. And we can go with contains in this case. And I'm gonna start with the at symbol and then whatever the competitor's domain is. So we'll do competitor1.com. And with a semicolon, you can add additional values within this one rule. So I'll do at competitor2.com so on and so forth. So you can add the email domains of all your competitors here. And if they match any of them, they're gonna get added to the list automatically. You can use this exact same technique to create a dynamic list of target accounts too. If you know you've got these top 20 accounts that you wanna go after this year, and you wanna make sure that if, if anybody has interest from one of those accounts, and they're coming into your marketing somehow, create a dynamic list the exact same way based off email address and domain. And then of course you can create subsequent automations to notify yourself or notify the salesperson when one of these you know, target accounts comes in uh, through your marketing efforts. But for now, we'll leave it at competitors here, You know, add as many other competitor domains as you'd like, and then hit run rules. So this is gonna to match to everybody whose email address ends in at competitor1.com or at competitor2.com, so on and so forth. And then throughout the system, you'll see areas where you can select lists for suppression and you can choose your competitors list here to make sure that you're not educating your competitors and giving away your content and your marketing strategy without your knowledge. In this build video, we're gonna create a static list and we're gonna turn it into an internal test list. So we'll go through both, so you've got a good understanding of how to use them in your marketing. So first thing to do is let's go to the segmentation list screen. You get there by clicking on the prospects tab across the top, and then clicking on segmentation on the left, and segmentation lists right underneath that. So we've talked already about dynamic lists versus static lists. Let me show you how to make a static list. It's pretty easy. Just click add list in the upper right hand corner and by default, it's static. If you check the box to make it dynamic, it'll then switch to dynamic. So some good examples of static lists would be any kind of list that you, you probably don't need to use over and over again, or a list that's not based on any specific data point within Salesforce. So example of the first kind, let's say you've got an event, right? Or maybe, You've got a you know thank you campaign that you wanna have go out. And so you only want that thank you email to go to people who attended the event or sent you a Christmas card, something along those lines. Well, it's kind of a one-time thing. It's not really something you're gonna to need to use over and over again. And so a static list would be just fine for that because we don't need it to automatically update. The people who are on it are on it because they did something in the past and we're gonna use it for a specific purpose. That second reason for using a static list is if there's no data point for us to use to pull people onto a list dynamically. So this might be VIP customers as an example. Maybe we don't have a specific metric for VIP. It's not as if they spend more than $100,000 with us, they're VIP. Maybe it's just picking and choosing the customers that you love to work with the most or the ones that have helped you in some way with testimonials or introductions. And so in that case, you're really you know, handpicking the people that would be on this list. We don't have rules for that. So a static list is the right way to go there. 
So I'm going to call this VIP customers, actually. I think that's a good name for our example. And of course, you can add it to a folder within the system and you can apply tags. Now also take note of this email test list box. We're gonna come back here and check this a little bit later. For now, we'll skip it because we're just making a normal standard static list. So click create list. There you have it. Here's our static list. Now the next thing is to put people on here. So we can put people onto a static list manually by going to their prospect record and say, we'll click into Alexis Rose and click on lists. All our static lists are gonna show up here. There's our new VIP customers one. We can add Alexis Rose as a VIP customer and hit save there. Pretty easy. You could also add people to static lists from these prospect list views throughout the system. So in Pardot, there's lots of different places where you might see a table of prospects just like this. In this case, we're under the pro, you know, Pardot prospects area, but this could also be a list of people that clicked on a link in an email, something like that. You can check this box and select everybody on this page of the table, or we can click this link in the middle and select everybody in this view, even if they're not on this page of the table. And at the bottom, you've got the option to add to list. So that's another way you can add people to a static list. The third way is to import them. So up here, import prospects, when you go through the process of uploading a CSV spreadsheet, it'll give you the option to add them to a list upon import. So this is great for brand new prospects because you got to add them to Pardot to begin with, but it's also good for people who already exist in Pardot. Maybe you've got a list of people you know are there in Pardot, but you have that CSV outside of Salesforce, outside of Pardot. You can just import them in, add them to a list in one go, and it's much faster than you know logging into each prospect record here and adding them manually. And then finally, the other way to add people to a static list is from the Salesforce side of the house. So if you mark a list as available to the CRM, CRM visible, then salespeople on the lead record or the contact record could add them to that list. And for something like VIP customers, you definitely wanna make that CRM visible. So the salespeople who know the customers best are able to choose their top customers and add them to a list like that. So I came back to our VIP customers list here. And if you click the edit button in the upper right hand corner, you get this list information screen. It's the one we started with. And you can check a box here for CRM visible. And that's gonna make it show up on the Salesforce side. So let me show you an example. If we you know, click on Alexis Rose here and we take a look at her contact record in the system, we'll be able to see that she's a member of that VIP list. In this particular setup, we've got a Pardot tab over here on the right, and we have a Visual Force component that is pulling in list membership from Pardot. Now you might have this under the details section, you might have it in, in a different area in the system, but it's available for anybody that has Pardot to add this component to your layout. And so a salesperson can then access any list here that is CRM visible to add or remove people from it. So maybe Alexis Rose is no longer a VIP customer, me as a salesperson, I can hit that little X and I can remove her from that list. This is also a really good way for you to create long-term nurture programs, say 90 day, six month long nurturers and give salespeople the ability to put people on those lists or to create lists of specific interests, interested in product A or product B. Again, when the salesperson's talking to them, you know maybe they're not yet ready to buy, but they could then add them to that list for that product interest. And now moving forward, you're able to send them more relevant marketing material and hopefully convert them to a customer later. So those are the basics of a static list. You know, essentially there's no rules to add or remove people from it. That's all done manually. And you can do that by selecting a prospect individually or a lead or contact individually, if it's CRM visible, using a table within Pardot to add multiple people at one time, or by uploading and importing prospects here. There's a couple other ways to add people to lists as well. Uh, and that would be through different automations. 
So, you know, if we've got a form that gets filled out, one of the completion actions could be to add them to a list, or we could use an automation rule or a segmentation rule or an engagement program and have steps in there that would potentially add them to a list as well. So we've got a number of manual ways to do it, but you can automatically add people to static lists. It's just an automation that's gonna be doing it for you rather than rules that are inherent in that list that are adding people or removing people from it. So let's talk a little bit about internal test lists now. I'm gonna come back here to segmentation and segmentation lists. And so we're getting a little better understanding what these different columns are. We already talked about what dynamic is, what CRM visible is. Now we have test. So a test list is a list of prospects in Pardot that you can use for testing emails. So when you build out an email, which we'll go through in a later day, there's a step where you can test that email, which you definitely wanna do, and you can select from any of your available test lists to send that email out. And make sure it looks good across different phones and browsers, make sure it all looks great. And so we can actually take any of these static lists and turn them into an internal test list. So if I look at VIP customers here, and I edit it just like before, you know, we could check this box. And now our VIP customers is our test list because maybe they opted in to help us with our marketing testing. Probably not, so we'll uncheck that. So I'm gonna come back to segmentation lists. And right now we just have one test list called internal test list. But let's add another one and I'm gonna call this sales team test list. So the nice thing in Pardot is you can create multiple test lists. And you'd likely want to do this because you've got different audiences within your business that you might want to bring in from time to time to make sure an email looks great before you send it. So most of our clients, they'll have a test list of just the marketing team, you know, maybe just one or two people that are actually building out the emails. They're kind of the first line of testing. And then they might have a sales team test list. So they're getting you know, broader reach, getting more eyes on the material. And they might even have a third test list that has executives included as well. So occasionally they're gonna be sending out an email or a message on behalf of the CEO or the owner of the company. It'd be great to send them a test version of that first, get their final sign off before you hit send. And you can have all those test lists in the system. So we're gonna call this sales team test list. Check the box here for email test list and click create list. Everything else works the same way as a standard static list that we've already been looking at. The one thing that's a little bit different about test lists is that we can add people to an internal test list from their user record. So an internal test list is still made up of prospects, prospect records within Salesforce with their name and email and whatever other details. But your colleagues are gonna be users in the system, not prospects probably. So if you go to Pardot settings and come over here to user management on the left and go to users, you'll get a list of the users within Pardot. You can select them in the table and the bottom drop down here has an option to create prospect and add to test list. So this will automatically create prospects from the details of the user record. And so it saves you a lot of work trying to do that manually for testing. And it'll also add them to the test list of your choice at the same time. So I'm gonna add both of these users to the sales team test list. And what happens in between there is Pardot's gonna automatically create prospect records for each of these users for us. Hit go. And that's it. If we come back to our prospects tab and back to segmentation lists, we've got our sales team test list right here and we've got two prospects added to it automatically. And these prospect records have details that have been pulled from the corresponding user records. In this video, we're gonna take a look at scoring and how you can change the default scoring model in Pardot. So we already talked about the point of scoring, right? It's a number that's gonna go up as a Pardot prospect is acting more and more with your marketing material. It should be an indication of how interested they are in you based on their activity. So. If you look at a prospect record, we'll see their score on the right-hand side from their activity. But this is really just the base level score, and there's a scoring model behind it. 
So here we can see a bunch of standard forms were filled out and they're worth 50 points each. We can change that. We can change how many points a form is worth generally across the board. What you can also do through automations and through engagement programs is we can increase or decrease a score really based off any factors that we, we care about. And you might wanna do that if you've got, for example, an engagement program that is highly educational and it's going step by step and it's teaching them about your services or it's some sort of education that if they were to complete it and have strong interest in that is a good indicator that they're a good fit for your business. If they get to the end of that program, we can add a step to increase their score by another 100 points or something like that. So there's lots of little areas throughout the system where we can influence that score directly and change it. But what we're gonna take a look at here is how do we change the base level scoring model? So if you don't want a, a typical standard form to be worth 50 points, maybe you want it to be worth 30 points, you know, we can change that. So you can find that by clicking on Pardot settings across the top of the screen here, going to automation settings, and then clicking on scoring. And from here, we've got all of our scoring rules listed out and what their current point values are. And some of them are fine. You know, a custom redirect click at three points, I think that's fine. A form submission at 50 points, I think is also fine. One thing that I don't agree with is the default for opportunity lost to be negative 100 points. In my experience, some of the best prospects are ones that you had an opportunity with previously. So for some reason they didn't purchase, usually it was timing or maybe the budget wasn't quite there. Maybe they're at a point in their business where they don't quite need your services, but you know, in six months, maybe they will. So just because you have a lost opportunity, to me, that doesn't mean that they have zero interest. You know, if anything, that's probably a good pool to start from for future prospecting. So you can see here that the you know, default model, when an opportunity is created, the prospect will get 50 points. But if it's lost, they get negative 100 points. So they're, they're going backwards considerably. I think that this should probably be more like negative 25. So if an opportunity is created, we have 50 points. If we weren't able to close the deal, we'll decrease it by 25. You know, maybe they're a bad fit and we should have qualified them out earlier. Or maybe it's timing or authority or some of these other things that had prevented that deal to go through. So to change that value from being negative 100 to negative 25, you can hit edit scoring rules in the upper right hand corner. From here, you can choose that activity, opportunity lost, and we can change the score, negative 25. And you could add additional scoring rules here and, and change multiple at one time. And then I'll hit save. There we go. Now opportunity lost is negative 25 points. The interesting thing about these particular scoring rules is they are retroactive. So it'll go back through your database and it'll change the score for each prospect based on their activity, based off these point values. So if we have anybody in the system that had lost an opportunity previously, they just got a 75 point boost because we changed it from negative 100 to negative 25. That's not the case for most things in Pardot. Most things in Pardot, when you set up an automation or you change something, it's just moving forward. But these standard scoring rules are an exception to that. Uh, we also have scoring categories here. This is a more advanced feature. This, if you've got the plus edition or higher, you can have multiple scores for a given prospect. Maybe you've got two completely different product lines and you wanna have a score for product line A, product line B you can set that up with categories. But the scoring rules edits apply just the same here. And there's that same edit button in the upper right if you need to change them. So that takes care of the main scoring setup within Pardot. As you start using Pardot and start using the score, you know you should iterate on this. Change it over time uh, as you dial in and you get a better understanding of what activities are a true indication of their interest and what activities maybe not so much. And so come back here periodically and update it to make sure that it makes sense based off the behavior of your prospects. In this build video, we're gonna take a look at grading. I'm gonna show you step-by-step step how you set up grading in Pardot so you can better understand who your best prospects are in your system. So the first thing we need to do 
is click on the prospects tab across the top and then go to segmentation and then go to profiles. So grading is based on profiles and you can have multiple profiles within Pardot. And within each profile, we'll have different sets of criteria on which to grade that particular prospect. Now, a prospect can only have one profile. And, and you might wanna have multiple profiles if you have very different types of prospects in your system. So if you are a marketplace and you have buyers and you have sellers, then having those two different profiles are probably gonna be really useful. Another example might be if you're a roofing company and you have insurance customers and you have you know retail or cash deal customers. That might be a very different profile as well, depending on different types of criteria. So to begin with though, I would just start with default. You know, start with one, get that set up, get that working. And then if you want to expand and have, you know, different profiles so you grade people differently, you can absolutely do that in the system. So we're gonna click on the default profile here and take a look at the default criteria. It's company size, industry, location, job title, and department. All right, well, that's not bad. You can hit the edit profile button in the upper right-hand corner, and we can add additional criteria, we can remove, we can change the name of it. And what we're looking at in this screen is really a label. So there's no logic going on here. It's more like a category of criteria that you're interested in. So company size, we could easily write in number of employees, right? Or we could write in number of beds if you're selling to hospitals, as an example. Or enrollment if you're selling to teachers uh, or to schools. Doesn't matter. In our case, we'll leave it as company size. Industry is often a really good one to include if you're selling across different industries. Location is also valuable if geography makes a difference in what you're selling. Now, I would say this doesn't have to be your perfect customer. Instead, I think that grade should ultimately reflect who's most likely to buy. So for example, you might be a services company and you might have clients on the West Coast, but maybe you don't have any bias on the West Coast. Maybe you would be happy to work with any company across the United States or even across the globe. But if most of your customers are in say Southern California, you might wanna give a boost to other companies that come in in the door, other prospects that are in Southern California because the likelihood that they're gonna become a customer is probably higher. They might know your existing customers, they might have come through as a referral from an existing customer. And certainly when you start talking about work you've done in the past, they're gonna recognize some of the names of people. So location is a great one to have. Job title, also good for looking at CEO, executives, if that's important. If you're selling a product to the marketing department at a company, then obviously we want marketing to be included somewhere in that job title. And then department here, I often find is a little bit duplicative of job title. So I'm just gonna delete that one. But any other ones you wanna add, definitely do so and think about what's that criteria that makes somebody a really good fit for our business or what's that criteria that makes them very likely to purchase? So it doesn't necessarily have to be that you like them better as a prospect than somebody else because they're in California, but if they're more likely to purchase because that's where the, most of your customers are, then I would leave that in there and make sure that it's reflected in the grade. So that's our criteria name here. On the right-hand side, we've got grade adjustment. So the grade is gonna be like an A or an A minus or a B plus or a C, and whether or not somebody matches against this criteria will increase or decrease that grade. And so our options here are one, two third, or one third letter. So if you're at a C and you match the company size with a grade adjustment of one, you go to a B. If you're at a C and we set this to two thirds, you would go to a B minus. If we set this to one third, you would go from a C to a C plus. So it's a way to weight these different criteria here as, as needed. So I would say company size will make that very important. Job title will make very important. Maybe industry is less, put that at one third, and location will put at two thirds. But again, it, it's really up to you on how you see the different 
criteria and how it compares to each other, how it's weighted relatively. Okay, once you're happy with that, hit Save Profile, and we've got a great start. So I'm gonna click into one of our prospects here. We'll take a look at Jake Lund. And if you click on the Profile tab, you can see our criteria shows up here. And if we were to manually change this criteria, we can hit thumbs up or thumbs down to say that they matched our different criteria. So we'll say they matched three and on industry, maybe we don't have any data on it. So we'll just skip that. If you come back to overview, you can see that reflected right here in the grade. Jake has now moved up to an A minus, but obviously we don't wanna do that manually. So let me show you how you automate it. The way to automate the grade is to use automation rules. If you click on the automations tab here, on the left-hand side, the second option is automation rules. And we can use these rules to grade people dynamically so that we don't have to do it manually. Now, especially with grading, we're gonna need to create multiple rules here because they're all set up with a simple, if this, then that type logic. So if industry is education, then say they match on profile, criteria, so on and so forth. So we'll need to create at least one rule for each of the different criteria we've got in the profile. So I'm gonna start with location. And a naming convention here is really helpful. So I like to start with grading, and then I'll call this you know, industry. And a folder is a great idea for these rules as well, just to keep them organized. So I'm gonna add a new folder here, and I'm gonna call it grading rules. There we go. And of course, you could add a tag as well. Description is also recommended for these so that it, it's easily understood what's happening in this rule without having to take a look at the individual steps of it. So we'll say, if industry is education or government, match. Looks pretty good. If you create additional profiles, you'll need to create additional rules and you would likely want to change your naming convention to grading dash profile dash industry. Maybe default profile, maybe whatever the name of that secondary profile is. All right, now we're ready to build this thing. So we've got our rules section and our actions section for an automation rule. If you click add new rule, you'll see it's really similar to building a dynamic list. We've got many of the same options here to choose from and the add rule versus add rule group works exactly the same way as dynamic lists. So in our case, we're gonna click on prospect default field and we'll choose industry. And if industry is, we can then write in education or we can write in government with a semicolon separating them if you wanna have multiple values, just like a dynamic list. And you can write in as many values as you'd like here. And if a prospect has education or government or whatever other values you add here, then we want this rule to take an action. So that's the next thing we're gonna add. Add a new action. And what we're looking for here is change prospect profile criteria. Here it is, change profile criteria. Select that. Next drop down is to choose which profile. In this case, we only have one. Next option is to choose which criteria from that profile we wanna select. In this case, of course, industry is what we're looking for. And then we can say, does it match? Does it not match? Or is it not known? So we want it to match. And I recommend when you're first creating these profiles, just create matching rules. So if you've got four different criteria, then create four different rules for the values that are gonna match so that uh, we're increasing that grade. Because everybody starts off at a D. So they're already pretty far down. So start with matching to move that D up and get it closer to an A. But you can, of course, create the inverse. You can create rules that specifically do not match as well. That's a little bit more advanced. I think it's only useful if you know that there's a particular industry or job title that is a negative signal of being a good customer. For example, maybe you're selling only in the United States. So if somebody comes in and their location is outside of the United States, it's a negative signal. If they're in Canada or Europe or somewhere else, let's say it does not match so that that grade gets decreased and we're not accidentally thinking that they're a better prospect than they are because maybe they're just never gonna be a customer if we can't sell outside of the US. But again, start with the positive side of things. Create these rules based off the values that are gonna to lead to a match. 
All right, now you've got a couple other options here. You could repeat the rule or we could execute in real time. So I don't recommend repeating the rule. It's just not necessary and it'll use up resources. If we were to repeat this rule every single day, it's gonna match the same people every day and won't change anything. So it's just not really needed. And then execute in real time, this is not the kind of automation we need to run immediately. It can be batched throughout the day uh, and update those grades. So we don't need to check that either. Let's preserve our resources, make sure everything else is running very, very fast. And that's it. Click create automation rule. Whenever you create an automation rule, it will be in a paused state. So all you need to do here is click the actions wheel on the right hand side and click on resume. You can also click into that automation rule. And at the top, there's a little link that says resume automation rules. Once you do that, it is live. And this is going to start grading our prospects in the background. And if their industry is education or government, it's going to increase that grade. So to finish out setting up grading, create additional rules, one for each one of those criteria in your profile. Once that's set up, it'll automatically run well into the future. So as you're adding new prospects, they're going to get graded automatically. And you'll be able to see, are they an A or a B or a C plus or how high a quality are they? It's also a really useful tool if you get a list of prospects from a trade show or an event or somewhere else and you're importing them into Salesforce, you'll be able to see right off the bat how high quality was this event? Like, Are these our kind of prospects or not? Even before a salesperson reaches out to them, you'll have this grading model to understand how good of a lead list was that that you just imported. That was the strategy and the build videos on segmentation from our one week Pardot course. We hope you found it valuable. If you'd like to see the other lessons from that course, you can click the link in the description below or you can go to academy.rotive.io. And if you did find it useful, please hit the like button and click subscribe. Thanks for watching.